Hey guys, Carlson here to cover video lecture part two of chapter eight. We're going to go through sections five and six, which will be the bulk of your notes, and then we'll talk a little bit about sections 12 and 13. So let's go ahead and get started with 8.5, which talks about how the brain and the spinal cord are surrounded by three layers of membranes called the meninges. The central nervous tissue receives physical stability and shock absorption from the meninges. And uh, this is necessary to allow the central nervous system to maintain many things. A uh, high metabolic rate, access to an abundance of nutrients, a continuous supply of oxygen, isolation from blood-borne compounds, and then protection against damaging contact from surrounding bones. So it's very important uh, for the functioning of the brain and the spinal cord. The three meningeal layers are the dura mater, the arachnoid, and the pia mater. The dura mater is the outermost covering of the central nervous system and is made up of two fibrous layers. And remember that dura meant hard, uh, mater meant mother. So this is the hard outer core of the meningeal layers. The arachnoid is a second layer separated from the dura mater by the subdural space. And it's a layer of squamous cells. And remember, arachnid means a spider. And so there's lots of kind of interwoven uh, vessels and things like that in this layer that we'll talk about in a second. And then finally, the pia mater um, is the innermost layer, of the, which is separated by the subarachnoid space. And remember, pia meant delicate. So this is the delicate kind of inner layer of the meningeal layers of the brain and spinal cord. Here is a picture of the meninges of the brain and spinal cord. So if you look at uh, the brain here, the cranial cavity is kind of focusing in on this section here, uh, the outer layer, and here is your dura mater. Uh, you have the dural sinus, which we're going to talk a little bit about in a second here. Um, we have your dura mater inner layer. And then that subdural space that I said separates it from the arachnoid. And so here's your arachnoid, so you can see why it has that prefix in its name. It's kind of spider-like. And then your subarachnoid space. It's kind of like this deeper, darker region here. And then the pia mater, which is that innermost layer. It looks a little bit different in the spinal cord. Um, you have your dura mater here. Right above it is your epidural space containing uh, fatty tissues. Arachnoid here. Uh, the subarachnoid space, and then the pia mater. Now, that um, epidural space here is actually where anesthetic is usually given to uh, women in childbirth to control pain. So if you were to uh, receive medicine during childbirth, this is where they would inject it. Um, and that fatty tissue helps, you know, make sure that it doesn't cause you too much pain. All right, so... Um, some important notes about each layer. The dura mater, again, is the outer layer. It is fused to the periosteum of the skull. Uh, typically, the inner layer is separated by a narrow gap containing fluids and blood vessels. A deep in the cranial cavity folds, it, it, will, it will fold, I'm sorry, into sheets called dural folds and act like seat belts to hold the brain in position. And then the outer layer is not fused to bone in the spinal cord, okay, like it is in the brain. Uh, the arachnoid, again, the subdural space separates it from the inner layer of the dura mater. It contains a small quantity of lymphatic fluid to reduce friction between surfaces. Deep in the layer of the arachnoid lays, lies the uh, subarachnoid space, which is made up of collagen and elastic fibers, making that kind of spider-like appearance. Uh, the subarachnoid space is filled with cerebral spinal fluid as well for shock absorption, transportation of gases, nutrients, chemical messengers, and waste products. And then right now your pia mater, uh, member is separated from the arachnoid by the subarachnoid space. It's bound firmly to underlying neural tissue. Uh, blood vessels servicing the central nervous system will run across this layer. And then uh, it's highly vascular, which aids in the need for that high metabolic rate for the central nervous system. All right, moving on to 8.6. The spinal cord contains gray matter surrounded by white matter and connects to 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Now, the spinal cord does serve as a major highway for the uh, passage of sensory impulses. This is just a section of it, uh, and it takes us to the brain and of the motor impulses that then come from the brain. It integrates info on its own and controls spinal reflexes. Those reflexes are automatic motor responses ranging from withdrawal from pain to complex reflex patterns such as sitting, standing, walking, and running. 
And here's some more anatomy descriptions of the spinal cord. It's approximately 45 centimeters long, and at its uh, largest point, it's a max of 14 millimeters wide. The diameter of the cord decreases as it extends toward the sacral region, which is the lowest region. Exceptions are some enlargements. Uh, the cervical and lumbar. The cervical enlargement supplies nerves to the shoulder girdle and the upper limbs, and then the lumbar enlargement provides innervation to the pelvis and lower limbs. And we'll look at that in a second here. It does lead into the coccyx with a slender strand of fibrous tissue, and this is going to help anchor to prevent movement upward. Okay, so a little bit more on the spinal cord, and here is that cervical enlargement where you can see the spinal cord gets a little bit wider. Um, same here with that lumbar enlargement. Uh, the spinal cord does have a narrow passageway filled with CSF or cerebrospinal fluid. This is called the central canal and I'll show you a picture of that here shortly. Um, there are 31 segments identified by letter which is a region and number so like here um, we have T1 that's the thoracic region and that is the uh, first one for that region, the first um, segment. Every segment has a pair of dorsal root ganglia that brings sensory info to the spinal cord. Every segment has a pair of ventral roots containing axons of central nervous system motor neurons. These control the muscles and glands by uh, providing motor output. Both the dorsal and ventral roots are bound together by a single spinal nerve and it's called a mixed nerve for that reason. So let's take a look at those pictures. Um, here's that dorsal root ventral root, they will come together as you can kind of see here branching together at what they call a single spinal nerve. Now um, this is a section of the spinal cord and you do need to be familiar with some terms. Um, here is that central canal that I was talking about, that little hole right here that contains the cerebral spinal fluid. And then you have what they call horns. And here it's pointing out the posterior gray horn, lateral gray horn, and the anterior gray horn. They're calling it gray because it's mostly made up of cell body ganglia and causing that gray color. Now here it shows you the functional organization of that gray matter. And the, this portion here, that posterior gray horn, is more for sensory, okay, somatic and visceral sensory. And then the anterior part of the lateral region, but mostly the anterior region, um, is helpful for motor nucleus. Okay, bring messages back out, uh, making something happen. And then finally, uh, we have the three columns of white matter. You see a posterior white column, you have a lateral white column, and an anterior white column. And basically, um, axons carry sensory information or motor commands in these areas. The ascending brings sensory info towards the brain and the descending com or tracks of those columns uh, convey motor commands into the spinal cord. <clears throat> Alright, um, A12 just talks about what happens as we age uh, structurally and functionally to the nervous system. So we're just going to bring up the main points and basically anatomical and physiological changes begin by the time you're 30 and then they just start to accumulate over time. But 85% of individuals above age 65 lead relatively normal lives. They may see notable changes in mental performance and in central nervous system function. And these are some common age-related changes, uh, such as reduction in brain size and weight. This results from a decrease in the cerebral cortex. A reduction in the number of neurons. Um, brain shrinkage has been attributed to the loss of cortical neurons, but the same loss does not occur in the brain uh, stem nuclei. A decrease in blood flow to the brain, this is probably one of the uh, biggest ones that can cause prob other problems. Um, this is due to a gradual increase of fatty deposits in the walls of blood vessels. It's called arteriosclerosis. It also affects arteries throughout the body, so you've probably heard of that before. It may not cause a cerebral crisis, but it could increase the chance of stroke. Changes in synaptic organization, so the number of dendritic Dendritic branches and interconnections appear to decrease, resulting in a loss of synaptic connections. Therefore, we have a decline of neurotransmitter production. And then finally, intracellular and extracellular changes in the central nervous system. Um, there's an accumulation of deposits, which could be in the form of pigments, plaques, or proteins. Uh, this is normal due to in aging, but in excess, it could cause other problems. Uh, finally, 813 just reminds you to look closely at how the nervous system is integrated with other body systems. And on page 302, 
Um, there's this picture, that system integrator we look at for every section, and I would suggest looking at it how uh, the nervous system interacts with the integumentary, the skeletal, and the muscular, and just maybe jot down a few notes about that. And we are done, and I'll see you guys next time.